In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever, and to the age of ages, amen. Good morning. Our meditation this morning is entitled, Saint Damiana, Princess of the Coptic Martyrs. And we're going to be speaking about primarily three main points. The consecration to serve God. Secondly, her father's denial of the faith. And then thirdly, her own martyrdom. And before we begin, I just want you to take a deep breath and let it all out and relax your shoulders. <sighs> One more time. <sighs> also, I want you to put a smile on your face. We don't have to be too serious. Sometimes we take our spiritual journey very seriously and we feel we need to be like very straight have a f straight faith and but you know what we we just need to to relax because we're home now we're safe we're in the church now and i i remember uh, a big storm that happened yesterday it was uh, right in the middle of uh, of a wedding that we're having here in the church and uh, you know everything that came to my mind then is that we're safe we're in the sanctuary of god First of all, because it's a very strong building, and of course nothing, no wind or rain is going to impact it. But even if it did, you know what? Just knowing that uh, life is very fragile, and anything could happen at any time, um, you know, we're ready. We're ready at any time. And again, a Christian's ability to feel that sense of safety and security comes with our faith in, and confidence in Christ, that we are on the right path, and we are in Christ. We're living in Christ and nothing should move us or take us away uh, from our confidence in, in our faith. And it's with that mindset and approach, we look towards the life of St. Damiana as a beautiful, true model of Christian living. Throughout the month of May, we've been uh, studying some of the pillars of the faith whom we celebrate during this month. We started right at the beginning with the celebration of the Feast of St. George on May 1st, and then a week later, St. Mark, a week later, St. Athanasius, and we had several meditations throughout this month on some of these outstanding and amazing saints who have really showed us and uh, gave us an example of how to live a Christian living. And we cannot leave this many series without speaking about one of the most beloved female saints to acknowledge the contribution of women to the Coptic faith and to the Coptic tradition and to understand that there's a role for each and every person of us to play, regardless of our responsibilities, that God can use us in an amazing way. In looking and considering the lives of the saints, we are following the commandments of scriptures that says, praise God in all his saints. So when we are looking at this life, we're not giving them all the glory. We're giving God all the glory because we're praising God in the lives of people who were committed and convinced to walk the spiritual path. And also, we remember the beautiful words in uh, the epistle to the Hebrews, chapter 13 and verse 7, when the scripture would tell us to remember those who have spoken the word of God to us, whose faith we should follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. So we're looking at them as role models, as real-life examples of individuals, as humans, who lived and walked on the earth, just like you and I, but they had a higher calling and we should be inspired by their conduct. So let us consider uh, three areas of the life of St. Damien. And by the way, St. Damien has two commemorations throughout the year. The first one comes on January the 21st, which is her, the date of her martyrdom. But there's a second commemoration that comes in the month of May on the 20th, so this past Friday, that we uh, remember the consecration of her church. So we'd love to uh, look uh, closely at her life and learn from her model, again, to inspire us as Christians living in the 21st century. St. Damiana was the daughter of Marcus, and Marcus was a governor in a certain region in, in Egypt. She was born late in the 3rd century, and uh, Egypt at that time was still under the, the rule of Diocletian. And Marcus, as a, a governor, um, had many responsibilities. He was representing the emperor, of course, in that specific region. And as his daughter, um, she could have been distracted by the life of glamour, 
uh, and glory of the world. Instead, she chose what the church calls the precious jewel. Because when we look at all the valuable things that we have in our life, we might own property or cars or have funds in the bank of all of these things. But the Lord Jesus would always speak about a pearl that has a value beyond any other value. And I can tell you that from my personal experience in, in a career before priesthood in uh, gems and in uh, precious metals, all kinds of trading, of all these things. And, and honestly, when, when a calling would, would come to serve God, and you know, some people would say, well, like, well you know, why would you leave a career in precious metals and all of these things, a lot of um, dollar amounts going back and forth and in and out, and you see this luster and glamour in the precious metal and all of these things. But you know, the one thing that, that God had always spoken in my heart is about the jewels that we have on the altar. And you know, uh, common mistakes that uh, some deacons do, when we are just kind of finishing communion, uh, some, some deacons say that there are still a little bit more crumbs. We call it crumbs of, of the leftover of the body. And says, no, no, in the church we don't call even the small tiny pieces crumbs. We call them jewels, jewels of precious value. And this is something that is hidden. It is concealed, not revealed from our eyes. But what we do in the church in our faith has such a tremendous value to us as Christians that only us, we are able to discern between forsaking what is temporal and choosing what is eternal. It is these jewels that are beyond human value, the priceless jewels that we value in our lives. And that's exactly what St. Nimiana did. He said, I don't really need to live in a palace. I don't really need to be a princess in the worldly matter. I want to choose Jesus Christ, our Lord. Here's the thing that some people don't understand. When we close the curtain, uh, you, look, uh, you look underneath, it says, St. Maurice, the uh, commander of the Theban Legion, and St. Verena, the bride of Christ. And uh, one time we had a gathering um, of, of many people who are from the community, and someone who was very observant uh, looked at that title, and, and he said, um, the bride of Christ? Was Jesus married? <laughs> and uh, we said, no, no. Actually, any um, woman at that time or up until now who dedicates her life to, to Jesus, we call her the bride of Christ. And Verena lived 300 years after Christ, so she couldn't be his real bride. St. Damiana was the same thing. Any um, lady, saint who dedicates her life to Jesus uh, is metaphorically uh, designated as a bride of Christ because she has chosen Christ over anything in that world. Furthermore, St. Damiana was also a great leader. A great leader because not only did she um, decide to go away and worship God in seclusion, but she gathered around her 40 young women who had the same passion for Christ. And they were a worshiping community. They were an early monastic community. They had their spiritual rules, and they dedicated all their time to worship God. And in that sense, we see in St. Damiana a sense of leadership in all people, women and men and youth. By the way, St. Damiana wasn't an, an old person. She was maybe in her late teens, early 20s, when she did all of these things. So she gives an inspiration to all the young people to say, what are my God-given talents that I can pursue in order not only to live a righteous Christian living, but to impact those who are around me. These leadership skills were manifested in her ability to gather these young women around her and to set for them a spiritual rule and to guide them. Secondly, we are inspired from the life of St. Damiana in her witness, in her testimony. So what happened under the rule of uh, Diocletian that he was not a Christian and he would persecute all the Christians. He heard that Marcus, her father, was a Christian and he told him that you need to abandon your faith. You need to worship idols and offer incense in front of them. Now Marcus did not have a very strong faith. He, he wasn't very grounded in his experience with Christ. And uh, Marcus ended up denying his faith because he wanted to keep his position as a governor. He didn't want to let go. He didn't want to face humiliation. So he actually ended up denying his faith. Sandemiana, in her full strength, 
she sent him a message. When she heard that her father denied the faith, send him a message saying, I would have rather heard that you lost your life than you had denied the Christian faith. And I really admire this about St. Damiana. By the way, before uh, immigrating to Canada, my family used to attend the church after the, the name of St. Damiana. So I have a very uh, personal connection with her as, as a beautiful saint. And maybe this is one of the things that I really admire about her, that she had her values and her morals set straight and her priorities very clear in life that her faith came first before anything else. It was very clear for her, even if it came at the price or costing her her relationship with her own parents. And this is something also that's amazing because quite often it's the parents who are running after their children, <laughs> asking them to come to church or to practice their spiritual lives and their kids are the ones who are running away. As a matter of fact, St. Damiana is an inspiration for an inverted spiritual living. The fact that she was the one who was committed to Christ more so than her own parents. And actually, to be in on all honesty, I see this in, in this generation a lot. A lot of our children and our youth and our young adults are very much connected to God and to the faith more so than their parents. It, this might come as a surprise, but actually it's true. Because in this generation, I see the young adults and, and the youth once they understand the faith and once they absorb it into their inner being, they're very happy to comply and to live, not to live a hypocritical life, not to have like two faces, one in the church and one outside. They are fully for Christ. And we have an amazing and outstanding generation just blossoming right in front of our eyes who are resembling that amazing model of Saint Damiana, the commitment to the faith at such a young age. And this is exactly what St. Damiana stood for. The scriptures tell us that we should be rooted and grounded in the faith. And um, yesterday, uh, during that uh, storm, when you saw, see the torrential rain and, and the wind, and, and as I drove, and I'm sure many of us uh, saw the um, hydro outages and all the damage, and I, and I saw this huge, huge tree that was plucked from its roots and it fell down. And I saw another tree that was cut by the storm right from the middle and it, and it uh, fell and it blocked the entire road. And I'm sure many of us saw some of these scenes. And the whole thing that I kept thinking about at that moment is that it takes decades and years to be rooted and grounded in the faith. But unfortunately, it might take a huge storm that could last minutes to destroy all the work of decades. What I always have in mind is the Twin Towers in New York. Remember when the planes flew into the Twin Towers? It took seven years to build those towers, seven years, and 20 minutes for them to collapse and to come down. And that's the tragedy, is that in many cases, Things take us ages and ages to, to build, like our spiritual life and our connection with God. But once the trial and the temptation comes our way, we may not pass. We may not succeed. We may end up breaking all the work that has gone in front of us. The scriptures would say, blessed is the person who endures temptation or trial. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Furthermore, the psalm would say, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. And that's why we need this immunity. We need this vaccination. Look, so many people are asking about, you know, should I be vaccinated or not? What does it do if I'm going to catch the virus anyways, what's the point of being vaccinated? No, vac vaccine protects us from the harms of the virus. And even if it comes to us, it will be like what the psalmist would say, like the shadow of death. Even though I, make, I may walk through the shadow of death, I will feel no evil. So the concept is that, yes, being part of the church community, being part of the faith, understanding my values and my morals in life, will not protect me from being tempted. Temptation will always come my way. But when it comes my way, I'm going to be ready for it. I'm going to stand still and grounded like that tree that did not fall during the storm yesterday. 
those who have fallen were the ones that had the weak roots maybe or the root or the weak stem that allowed this wind to break it down one of the most beautiful things about our church is our strongly rooted faith the one that is not shaken by trials and tribulations and persecution we will stand firm because we have already connected with God on a completely different level understanding our faith and its reason and where it's coming from and have committed to our spiritual path someone would also speak about blessed is the person who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly nor stands in the path of sinners nor sits in the seat of the scornful but his and her delight are in the law of the Lord and in his law they meditate day and night they shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruits in its season whose leaf also shall not wither and whatever he does shall prosper and this is exactly what Saint Demiana stood for when she spoke to her father very boldly and very clearly said you're wrong it's okay we as parents can be wrong we make mistakes and it's okay for our children to pinpoint to us our faults to remind us remember that you are a committed person to Christ how can you deny your faith and it's important to think together when are the moments that we deny our faith or we don't stand for our faith or we feel that we are weak but the good thing about our faith is that it's not just like a tree that breaks down you can never put it back in the ground for God restores us God heals us and brings us back whole to his community and this is our understanding of repentance and our understanding of confession and the sacraments of the church our understanding his love and his grace and his forgiveness he can bring us right back and this is exactly what happened with Marcus is that he heeded he listened to the voice of Demiana and he went back to the Euclid and he told them I am a Christian I'm born a Christian I will live as a Christian and I will die as a Christian I will never go back to worship this idols guess what did Euclidean just tell him good for you thumbs up go back no he tried to sway him to return he wouldn't he ended up um, receiving the crown of martyrdom and died as a martyr so I think this is one of the core points in the life of Saint Demiana that should be really an inspiration to us to understand that our Christian living is so important and essential and is a priority it doesn't come before anything else it doesn't come be, you know it, it comes before everything else we cannot compromise on our career and finances and relationships in many cases now what we, the trend that we're starting to to see a little bit in some people getting married they're choosing their married uh, their partner um, not necessarily was a Christ believing person they say what if they are of a different uh, religion I, I can compromise on that they have their faith I will keep my faith but they can keep their faith but the understanding of marriage that it's a union between a couple who are of the same faith and the same denomination and the same understanding of salvation and practice of the church there's some things that we as Christians cannot compromise on regardless what the cause is not for companionship not for marriage I cannot compromise my faith for any reason just for the sake of our time we go to our third and last point and we spoke about a consecration to serve God and her leadership we spoke about Marcus denial of the faith and her witness to him to return him back and finally her own martyrdom now when uh, Diocletian heard that uh, Demiana was the main cause for returning her father to the Christian faith he sent her soldiers and uh, they tried to sway her and uh, the 40 young women with her to leave and abandon their Christian faith and to uh, worship the idols and of course we can expect what this brave young woman said to the soldier he said uh, you know how can you trade this precious jewel that we spoke about earlier in my faith and trade it with stone something that is worthless it's not even a point of contention or a point of conversation this brave young woman had her priorities straight from a very early on time in her life the word martyria means two things of course the word martyr comes out of that Greek word martyria 
But it actually doesn't necessarily mean to die for the faith. It means to witness, to be a witness. Actually, um, the, the, the Arabic word may, may clarify it uh, a little bit uh, better when we say shaheed or shahada. Shahada, which is to witness, or shaheed means to be martyred or to be killed for the sake of the faith. It's the same root word, that word martyria. And that's why many of us, when we think about martyria, we think if I were living at the time of the apostles uh, or, you know, the persecution of the Christians, I would have gladly gone out on those streets and testified of my faith and I would have gladly died. But too bad we're not living in an era of martyrdom. Well, there are still, of course, martyrs happening, Christian martyrs throughout the world, and they are being killed. But the bigger problem that we're facing today is the ability for Christians to, to witness, to testify of their faith, even if there is a cost or consequence. Now, be careful. Being a, someone who testifies or someone who is a witness doesn't mean that we become rude or we become someone who is vulgar or someone who is not a respectful person or someone who insults others. No, on the contrary, no. But the I statements, the I statements are very gentle and respected. And we are living in an age of uh, political correctness, of course, and we don't want to offend anyone. But at the same time, it's important for us to know what we believe. I believe such and such. It may be perceived as something that is, you know, goes against what the mainstream thinks. But the most important testimony today for us as Christians is living as a true Christian, understanding that everything I do is being observed by someone else, showing people the utmost love and respect, even if they are different than us, religiously or their values or whatever, while being grounded in our faith, we respect others, we serve others. Service speaks loudly than any other um, words that we can say. Action speaks louder than words that we can utter. And this was the testimony of Saint Demiana and her friends, that they stood for the faith in a way that they were a living example of that faith. Well, there's much more to speak about this topic. I just wanted to highlight the amazing contribution of many of the women in the Coptic Church <coughs> who have led to us and given us tremendous examples of faith through their life, through their witness, through their testimony, through their service, and through their leadership. And we can learn from them. We can learn from them, each and every one of us. We also saw in San Demiana a living example of a committed Christian at such a young age that she was able to commit to Christ. And the scriptures would speak about remembering now our Creator in the days of our youth. We don't just need to wait until we're, you know, towards the end of our life to commit to Christ. It means I need a spiritual rule. I need an understanding of the faith. I need to dig deeper into the treasures that we have and commit to Christ because it will change our perspective on our living, the way that we live our day to day. The ability, her ability to witness with her parents, especially her fathers, and her own martyrdom. May her prayers and blessings cover us as we continue our spiritual journey to become more like Christ, seeing the example of these beautiful sayings. Glory be to God forever and ever. Amen.